Hello, and welcome to another episode of Leader Generation, brought to you by Tenlo Radio. I'm your host, Tessa Berg, and today's conversation will be about communities, and specifically the role they play in growing your business, getting more visibility, and engaging people where they're at today. So I'll be hosting today, but we have a big announcement coming soon. We'll be adding another host next month from a different perspective. So what you're here today will be much in the digital and technology and how we can use those to bring the experience to our buyers and customers. And moving forward, we're gonna start to sprinkle in how does lead generation benefit from the content uh, and experience and the copy and the messaging that is so important to how our message gets delivered and how our businesses are positioned. Well, let's rewind and get in today's episode. Our guest is Mark Donegan. Uh, he has 20 years of experience as a transformative and strategic B2B marketing professional. And his focus is on growth tactics that actually work and produce real results. He has worked with SaaS software licensing and wholesale companies and retail distribution models, which is perfect for our conversation today, especially from the perspective that a lot of us have had to function as transformative businesses during and post pandemic to really meet the evolving needs of our audience. So Mark, thank you so much for being our guest today. Absolutely, thanks for having me, Tessa. It's great to be here. So let's dive into this topic about community. What does building community really mean for companies, especially those in the B2B professional space? Well, you know, I like to just start with my personal behavior. And so I'm going to encourage everyone listening to just think about how you learn personally about products. And, you know, you can think about it in your personal life. You can think about it in terms of, of a business context, but I think we'd all be really hard pressed to say that those around us, and that can be, you know, friends, family in a professional setting, obviously colleagues, um, you know, other uh, professional influencers that we might look up to, or we might follow. That is how we discover new things. That's how we get validation that, that, you know, a, a product can work for us, or maybe there's even a solution that we're looking for. And so if we just start there and, and just sort of use common sense, not even, not even any sort of real advanced marketing strategy, you say, well, wait a second if it's coming through our networks you know i.e those around us eg communities then shouldn't we be trying to if not build certainly be an active member of these groups of these communities that um that our products can be discovered in so that may sound sort of like duh and like well yeah everybody knows that and maybe we all do know it, and yet how many of us are actually building communities as part of our marketing strategy? <laughs> and that's when the wake up call, I think comes, it's like, oh, wait a second. Yeah, maybe we should be looking into this. So that's where I'd start. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people maybe take their personal experience for granted. Before the yeah. pandemic, we were building community, especially on the commercial side, physically, like at conferences mm -hmm. and seeing right. people. So if people are sort of struggling with, okay, if I look at my personal experience, I feel it's changed a lot. What types of communities should I be looking for or where can I put myself that's yeah. more digital or online? Yeah, that's actually, that, that's, it's a great question. And, and we definitely need to spend some time talking about that because when you say community, I think the very first thing that a lot of us would think about is like social media. And if you come from a medium or certainly a, a larger company, then you, you might even have a whole team that's doing this. And so it could feel like, yeah, check the box. We're already doing that. You know, we've got six people over here and they're our community team and we have a community manager and we run a Facebook group and we have this group and we have that group and yeah, check the box. You know, that's what we do. I, I, you know, obviously without really understanding what business results that particular team is driving, I 
you know, I can't say if that's actually working or if it's actually achieving the way I define, you know, the success of, 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 of driving real business in terms of community. But I would argue that in a lot of cases, it's basically managing Facebook groups. And that's not what I'm talking about here. Now, um, not saying that that can't be a component of it, but let me try and unpack a little bit further. So the industry that I spend most of my time in and really have built my career on is very technical. It's in the, you know, if you watch Netflix uh, or any online streaming video, which we all do, uh, that that's where I come from and largely selling, you know, really niche technologies, software and services and products that are, that are sold to really a pretty small number of folks, uh, engineers. And a lot of times these people are very hard to, to get to because because you can't just search on job titles. Um, you know, sure, they, they might be a senior engineer. Yes, they might be a principal engineer. Yes, they may have the word video in their title, but it's, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's someone that we'd wanna to talk to for, for various reasons. So there's a real interesting challenge because you say, well, how, how, do you, how do you reach these people where it's very fragmented? They're often sort of, hidden away or tucked away in sometimes very, very large organizations. And so if you're a marketer, how do you get to them? It's a, it's a real formidable problem. Well, interesting thing happened. I'm going to give you a sort of a case study uh, of, of what community can look like. And um, this is a very organic example, which is why I absolutely love it, but it can be rebuilt like a like a prototype so about six years ago five or six years ago a group of these video engineers working for facebook and apple and google and a lot of small companies in the san francisco bay area began to meet for beers and it was just a meetup it was just a meetup and it was just engineers it was not organized by a company it wasn't a grand strategy it was just you know start out with 10 or 12 colleagues and inviting a few friends from another company long story short this monthly meetup began to grow and pretty soon they had 50 and 60 people and then they had 100 people and then they started to say well wait a second you know let's you know, okay, you know, it's fun to just get together and talk shop and, you know, and, and, and not be formal, but wouldn't it be cool if we invited in and we had speakers come? So then they started just uh, kind of taking turns, you know, like, Hey, I'll, I'll give a talk next month, you know, and then the next person I'll give a talk next month. And these are usually very technical and sometimes kind of, um, you know, off the beaten path. And they would talk about various, you know, maybe new technologies or things that were just interesting to them. Well, what ended up happening? What ended up happening was out of this came a conference. This conference is now 1,200 people of which these are the, you know, if you want to kind of air quotes, the who's who and the absolute laser focused ICP, you know, for us marketers of who you would want to talk to at Apple, Facebook, Google, you know, Twitter, Pinterest, go down the list. I mean, if you, you know, if you're selling into this space, these are the folks. And then what has happened is out of this, a company was born. This company is now a unicorn. And it all started in a meetup that was nothing more than our buyers. And again, I'm trying to, you know, relate very much as a marketer, because remember, these are the folks that we, maybe they don't own the budgets, but they certainly are the influencers in the particular space that I'm in. They begin to self-organize. And then as this grew and it grew and it grew, next thing you know, a company was born out of it. There's a conference. And of course, now at the conference, they have corporate sponsorships. And now there is, you know, more of a commercial element to it. Now, what's the learning here? The learning is, is that there was actually a need in the market because guess what? There was a competing and I say competing because there was another um, a media company that had a conference, had a lot of the same, at least on paper, panels and discussions, but guess what? It was all driven from a, from a, a, a marketing perspective, from a, everything was vendors trying to sell something. And these engineers are saying, we don't want to hear from vendors. We want to hear from our colleagues. Yeah. And this is 
the way that B2B marketing is being just absolutely flipped on its head is that it really is no longer now, you know, and maybe in some incredibly commoditized, in, you know, environments where it, there's, you know, 150 vendors and it's literally price and delivery availability, you know, that you'd make a decision on, okay, fine. You know, then, then this whole strategy probably isn't for you. But um, I would argue that's a very, 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 very small, um, uh, you know, set of, of, of the market, if you kind of look at the market. And so this whole idea of community is just absolutely upending the B2B process. And it all goes back to how do you and I behave in even just our personal lives when we're looking to, to, to make product decisions, et cetera. We go to our friends, we go to our network, we go to our, the Facebook group, we go to, you know, and that's how we do it. And, and, and we carry that over into our everyday work life. I love that example. And you highlighted two big challenges that we hear a lot. You started by saying they have to get closer to their audience and where their yeah. audience is. Yeah. And then you mentioned they have to know what's interesting to them. That's what mm -hmm. brought this community together is they had shared interests. That's the right. The challenge that we see a lot with our clients is they are vendors. <laughs> so yeah. how yeah. do they get involved in a community, get closer to the audience, be a yeah. part of what's interesting without selling. Yeah. And it's a very hard challenge and I'm, I'm a market. I actually came up through sales. So, you know, the, the roots of my whole trajectory into marketing and marketing leadership and strategy and everything I do today is through sales. And so even to this day, I am wired to, go for the kill, you know, to get the deal to, you know, to close the deal. And, uh, I just have to say that some of it is we, we, we have to just, I think there's an element of, of, of trust the process, you know, of just trust that, that the world has changed. And that, and that the way that we used to be able to structure our marketing campaigns in these beautiful three month cycles and, you know, in October and November and December of 2021, we could literally plan the 2022 marketing calendar. I mean, those are the good old days, weren't they? <laughs> you know, yeah. like we knew fall 2022, what our big push was and, and even already kind of had our media plan put together like in December of 2021. I, you know, and maybe there's an industry that still works. I, I don't know of one though. <laughs> and, and I think if we're all honest, we'd say, yeah, that, you know, doesn't matter. Consumer packaged goods. It doesn't matter if it's foods, if it's clothing, if it's, you know, uh, uh, it's, you know, of course those are consumer products, but, um, for B2B, it's just, it's moving so fast. And so I think first of all, um, the key is, is that we have to understand that, that the buyer right now, uh, and this is sobering, but the buyer doesn't need us. You know, the buyer doesn't need us. And again, the reason why I even make that point is that even just 10 years ago, the buyer still sort of needed us, even though the internet was still very much a thing. We all had websites. You could still do research. So you could argue like, well, how much has really changed in 10 years? You could still buy online. A lot of products you could still fully Amazon was still Amazon, you know, Amazon. So you could say, but what's really changed. But 10 years ago, there still was a little bit of a need to get the buyer involved. If I'm making a really large B2B decision, I need to meet with the vendor. I'm sorry, the vendor, not the buyer. Um, I need to meet with the vendor. I need to meet with the vendor representatives. I need to spend time with their engineering team, et cetera, et cetera. Now with new technology models like SaaS and with platform as a service and, and, and with all, all these self-serve, these product led motions that are happening, like literally an engineer who's just a couple of years out of college can end up making a key multi, multi-million dollar buying decision just because you know they're tasked to build something they go off they 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 sign up with a free account on on a on a platform they start building a product around it and then they bring it you know three weeks later to their boss and to the team and say hey what do you guys think you know this is this is what we built and they go wow this is amazing who's this company next thing you know there's this major opportunity for this particular technology provider and the first time that the that the buyer contacted the vendor 
was after they'd already used their product. And that's the reality of where B2B is today. So I think, you know, getting comfortable with that is the key to, to, to letting down our guard of, we always have to be selling, uh, because if we keep that up, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to this example. They, even though they have corporate sponsorships and they're, and they're pricey too. I mean, like, like they're not afraid to ask for real money <laughs> to sponsor this event. Um, they have a very, very clear, uh, no selling policy. And, and, and I, and I've witnessed it personally, uh, when you step over that line, boy, they are very quick. And, and the interesting thing is the community just comes around and goes, Hey, look, you know, we want to hear what you have to say, but we're not here to get pitched. And if you're going to pitch, you know, we're not going to listen to you. And so vendors learn really quick. Like if you came expecting, you know, to, to just pitch, it's not going to be a successful event for you. <laughs> but if you came to add value, if you came to participate in the community, if you came to be a member of the community, you're more than welcome. And guess what happens? You get to talk even more about what you do because mm -hmm. people have problems. And so they, you know, they say, Oh, wow, you guys are doing that. Hey, you know, so tell me about, and next thing you know, you're in an hour long conversation with someone working at a major target company that you would love to do business with all because it just started with, Hey, tell me about, and you were there to tell them about it. So that's a great answer. And you hit on a couple of qualities of community that I think are really important for people to look for one that they have that shared interest and two, that it's a place and a space where they feel comfortable starting to dig into their problems. Mm -hmm. What kinds of platforms do you see today that create that space uh, for people to build community, especially online as, you know, still we're, we're easing into getting back to the physical world. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the platform question is a really good one. And uh, if you have a budget, you know, and especially if you have a big budget, um, you there's all kinds of extreme examples right of what you can do but so let me try and paint the the spectrum uh because you know i also even if you have a budget getting just the executive sponsorship you know even if you're lucky enough that you say well you know i actually could carve off or peel off a couple million bucks to go do this initiative okay that's fine you've got that money it's at your discretion but boy you know, even if you have a really big budget, like a couple million dollars is, is a lot to put against something that's brand new that, 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 that might require the organization to acclimate to. So we, I, so I argue that we all probably need to start small. And so here's what it can look like. I, I love podcasts now, not just because we're on a podcast right now, but podcasts are the are first of all quite inexpensive to do now they they require is is you know you well know tessa a lot of human uh um resource you know and capital <laughs> so there's a tremendous amount of just you, you know work that only humans can do so um even though the actual quote unquote cost in terms of equipment and and services and all is is very very low um they you know there is some work required to pull them off and do them well but a podcast is an amazing place to start because it allows you to start creating content and in a lot of cases repurpose content that you're already creating. And then this audience that begins to form around the podcast is really the seeds or, you know, the, the, the founding uh, pillars of your community. And I have some, I have some great examples, which, which we can get to if you'd like about again, how podcasts can be built, but so you can start with a podcast and then you do something like you say, Hey, you know what? We have a podcast and okay, we're only getting 500 downloads in the first week. And someone in the organization says, well, that's nothing like we need to be producing, you know, uh, you know, 1500 leads a month or, you know, MQLs or SQLs or whatever the terminology is that, you know, someone might use. So like 500, that's, that's, that's nothing. Well, hang on before we just sort of like throw, throw out the podcast because of that, 
Then you say, you, you layer onto that and you say, okay, now a podcast is really great. And we know that we've got this highly engaged audience. We know there are ICP because if you design the, the podcast correctly, you're, you're only going to just by self-selection, get those people that you want to talk to. You know, so we can talk again a little bit about what strategy is there uh, to make sure that you've got the right listeners. But so you've got your 500, but you say, but now how can I engage them? Because one of the downsides of a podcast is, OK, I've got these 500 downloads, but I have no direct way to engage them. Maybe they come sign up on my website. Maybe they, you know, maybe they're on our email list or, but maybe not. They might just be on Apple podcasts listening, you know, mm -hmm. um, or Spotify or, or, or wherever. Um, so then, uh, what I, I have done that works very, very well is you create a, a, a um, LinkedIn group, not a, you could create a Facebook group, but I, I would argue for B2B and most a LinkedIn groups more effective. Now what's super interesting and I am, I've experienced personally is, is that the LinkedIn group will grow and scale faster than the podcast. And then next thing you know, you reach this tipping point where all of a sudden people are joining the LinkedIn group. They don't even know that it's associated to a podcast and it pulls them into the podcast. They get value. And all of a sudden you have this virtuous value circle that's going around. Now, you say, okay, Mark, well, that, that sounds really great if my monetization strategy is to try and build an audience and monetize the audience, but I, you know, but you haven't really talked yet about how I'm getting leads and how I'm, I'm teeing up meetings for my sales team, you know, which at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're all here to do, right? Is marketers. So, 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 so let's talk further about what this really looks like. So here's the thing about community is that when you have it, sales just is easier. When you don't have it, you are always stuck in the, we're fighting for meetings. You know, you listen in on the sales calls and the sales calls are just one account exec after the next saying, I'm still trying to chase that guy. Oh, what's happening with this one? Oh, you know, this guy, now he's gone dark on me. I'm still pushing this person. Oh, we can't. And it's the usual sales talk. When you have a community, all of a sudden the sales meetings go more like this. Yeah. So I was able to get them on the phone. Yeah. I chased them a little bit. We had a meeting. You know what the first thing they said is they love our podcast. <laughs> and you know what the first thing this person said over here is, oh, wow. They actually heard about our product because somebody had referred, you know, and they, and they, and they saw, you know, they saw a clip or they, or they joined the LinkedIn group and they saw our post and that caused them to reach out. And it's this kind of anecdotal feedback that begins to come into the market because again, these buyers are, are, are talking, they're moving amongst themselves. They no longer need us as a vendor. And, but, but they still are transferring information and where's it coming from? It's coming from, Hey, I have this need. And then someone else says, Hey, you know, I just listened to this really cool podcast episode. I heard this person talk about, you know, I, maybe you should go check out this company. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's how it gets built. And so that I said, I would paint kind of the, 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 um, you know, the, um, easy and, and the middle, and then the more difficult in terms of, so you can get started like a podcast, literally just, you can get started tomorrow. I mean, that's how easy it is. It requires dedication. It's, you know, I already said it, it's, it's work, but it pays tremendous dividends. Now you then extend that further and you say, well, what if we have this, this, so we we have our podcast and we're regularly producing content and we're adding value to the ecosystem. Now let's layer on to that a an event now, you know, right now kind of virtual would probably be what it is, but you know, hopefully very soon we'll be able to get to, um, you know, get to some sort of a physical event. And so now what could that look like? Well, that doesn't have to be a conference. What if, as we begin to build our community, we go into the three major cities where our, where our target customers are. So again, in my space, in video technology, it's the San Francisco Bay area, it's Seattle, it's Los Angeles, it's New York city. You know, and there's, you know, it's Austin, Texas. And of course these all are tech hubs, right? So, you know, some of it 
is like, well, yeah, they're major tech hubs, but you could go into these cities and you could say, Hey, guess what? We're going to do a meetup. <laughs> Sounds familiar, right? We're going to do a meetup of video engineers. We're just going to meet at this, you know, at this, at this bar for happy hour. We're going to meet here, meet there. We're gonna have a nice little dinner. You know, everyone's welcome. Come check it out. But what you do is you produce content that then can be repurposed. So maybe you invite, you invite in your CTO, for example, who happens to be a good speaker who maybe, you know, has developed some super interesting technology in their former life. Or in other words, you want a hook that's outside of just your solution. You do not want to show up and say, Hey, and, and, and we're going to spend 20 minutes talking about our latest, you know, widget. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, at, 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 yeah, I mean, people may still come just because it's an expensive steak dinner, but believe me, they're going to take nothing away from it and they're not going to go tell anybody about it. You know, it was just a free dinner, but instead you bring in, or you bring in an industry expert or you bring in somebody that this audience would be like, Oh wow, that'd be super cool. I, you know, I'd love to hear more about what that person's doing or that company or whatever. And, and then now you've got content. Now you can begin to repurpose that. And again, your channels feeding it back into the community. So now you're posting back into your LinkedIn group. Now in your email list, now you've got this fabulous content. Hey, check out this short video clip about, you know, this, you know, major figure in our industry talking about how they were a part of building, you know, this technology, which enables all of streaming video today. Okay. People, people want that. That's, that's exactly, that's adding value. And again, what's the cost for that? Uh, a couple airline tickets for the staff, you know, um, a, maybe a dinner, maybe a happy hour. So what you do that for like five grand, you know, mm -hmm. and yet if you go to these major cities and you've got even 25 people representing 10 or 12 or 15 major companies that you'd like to do business with. Wow. Talk about you know, low customer acquisition cost. <laughs> uh, yeah, you no, know, that is it's, really it's super. True. Yeah. And, and then you kind of continue on the spectrum and you go to an example that I absolutely love. And it's a cybersecurity company, uh, called recorded future and, uh, recorded future is the name of this company and they're in cybersecurity. And I, I'm not from that space, but I, you know, I, I've spent my whole career in technology. So I certainly, uh, know about the space. Cybersecurity is hyper, hyper competitive. The, um, it, you know, the marketing investment is huge. Marketing teams are huge. It is, I mean, it is, you know, it's, it's dog eat dog in that space. It is really, really, really tough. And even if you are very well funded, but you're sort of like, you know, number two, number three, number four, you're just, you know, it, it's, it's like being a new CR, it's like being a CRM vendor trying to compete against Salesforce. You know, you're just like, there's just nothing we can do you know, to compete. So recorded future, um, is, uh, is, is face this challenge. And they said, and the CMO said, well, what do we do? I mean, you know, we, you can only shout so loud. You can only buy so much advertising. You can only, you know, you can only bang the drum of more brand you know, and eventually it's just, it's gone. You know, it's like, it just, you know, we can't compete. So he did something super interesting. He said, you know, if you're working in the space of cybersecurity and staying up to date on the news and what's happening in the space, in the ecosystem, when I say news, I mean, in the world of cybersecurity is something that's very important to you because, you know, you want to know about new threats. You want to know about, you know, um, uh, you know, new research has come out. I mean, so you're probably daily doing Google searches or looking for this information. What if I built the portal that the entire industry went to? So guess what he did? He, instead of hiring three or four content marketers, he hired four journalists from the space and he built a website called the record. And the record is now in just like nine months, uh, it's only been, I think they launched it in about April of, of this year of 2021, maybe it's March, some, somewhere around there, uh, is now like the number one destination for cybersecurity 
news and updates and, and all of this in the industry. And you go to the website and it says the record. And I think it says, um, hosted by, or I think it just says by recorded future. Um, so, so there's a reference to the name, but as you, as you look through it, it is not heavy branded. There are not, you know, they, they're not putting banner ads on every, you know, on every article, every blog post, there's not, it's, it's, it, it, you would just think, oh, they're just a, they're a sponsor, right? No, they own it. This is their property. But what they did was they went and hired, and of course they had the budget to do this, you know, so I'm sure that, you know, they probably had to pay some, some good money to be able to hire these folks away because these are people who are writing in cybersecurity for publications. So, because again, if you're going to build an audience, well, you have to have great content. So he knew he couldn't do it just by, you know, kind of going and finding some product marketers in the space and saying, Hey, I want you to write a whole bunch of articles, you know, like, no, we need a journalist, you know, because th that's what this site is. And this has been an amazing, amazing uh, strategy for them. And, and he's on record. Um, <laughs> yeah, the record. He also has done a lot of podcasts uh, recently talking about this whole strategy. And so I'd encourage if someone really wants to, you know, kind of lean into this, go, uh, go check out what Recorded Future is doing with the record. And, and that's kind of on the other side where, you know what, you, you hire, you hire a team, you build a website, you actually build the portal for your industry. And there's yeah. other examples too that, uh, that I can give, but I think those are, those are good, good ones to start with. I, I agree. I think those are some really solid stories and something that is woven throughout is the type of measurement that's appropriate for yeah. measuring your community. So it's not about the MQLs or the SQLs in order to get to the bottom of the funnel, the way you measure is through feedback. How are people rating your content? Are they sharing it? Are they downloading it? And really looking at that more organic behavior to tell you how well are you doing and gaining visibility with the right people? And are you a part of what they find interesting and what they're looking for to help solve their problems? And I think that's different that's right. for a lot of B2B marketers who are, yeah, we're always asked like, how many leads is this generate? How many yeah. leads? But if you yeah. get those middle yeah. metrics really good, you can yeah. tie it down to MQLs and SQLs. At Ab absolutely. And, and this is also where sales and marketing alignment really helps because, and I, I witnessed this personally. So when I started my podcast strategy, um, with a company that I was leading marketing at, uh, it was late 2018 and, uh, had a, you know, had a, had a really great relationship with, with my boss, the CEO and founder of the company. And, and I, and I remember going to him and, you know, because I, you know, I, I knew that he'd have a positive reaction, but you know, I know some marketers will, will hear this and be like marketing leaders and be like, oh boy, if I propose that to my CEO, he would like kick me out, you know? But, but I went and I said, Hey, um, I've got this great idea. I, I want to do a podcast. Now we had already talked about it. And so it wasn't like he was kind of like, Oh, podcast, you know, he's like, Oh yeah, yeah. We've been talking about it and he loves podcasts. And so it wasn't that that was like novel, but I said, there's a twist. He's like, okay. I said, I, I, I don't, I don't want to brand it with our company. Now we will see, I'll find a way to say like sponsor by or something. It's not that I'm going to totally hide. And of course everyone, you know, can easily find out who, you know, and I, I was a little bit known in the space. So people knew who I worked for. So, you know, it's not, but, but I said, the point is, is that I don't want to lead with the company. And in fact, I want to be so bold that we'll even bring on our competitors. We'll, we'll interview our competitors. In other words, I want it to be like the water cooler. So I want it to be a place where I'm hosting the conversation and just like we go to trade shows and we stand around and talk to our competitors, you know, and of course we're both, you know, they're trying to get information from us. We're trying to get information from them, but we're being all friendly. Hey, how's it going? You know, and, yeah. we're, and, and, and it, it, but, but it's about value. Number one, the purpose of this is about value. Well, without even flinching, he said, Mark, I 
totally trust you. Go for it. It sounds great. I, I told, I, I get what, what you want to do. And you know, and, and so that's what we did. And so now almost 70 episodes in, uh, and even though I'm not working day to day with the company any longer, I'm actually still co-hosting that, that podcast for the space. And we have almost 70 episodes and, and here's what's super interesting is about six months in to the podcast. Uh, and we probably only had at that time, 15 episodes or something. So it's not that, you know, we'd been at it for a real long time. And at that time we're probably only getting 200 downloads in the first week. I mean, literally now think about what I just said. How committed you have to be to do a podcast. You're only getting a couple hundred downloads in the first week. You're not even talking about the company. Now, again, it wasn't costing a lot of money in terms of dollars and cents to do it, but it was requiring a tremendous amount of, you know, it, I was editing for a while myself. I mean, I'm the VP of marketing. Like what, like, you know, why should I be editing podcasts, you know? And but we just kept at it and the VP of sales came to me, my, my, my colleague, uh, and, and he says, Mark, he said, I, I can't give you any data. He said, I can't even tell you that I've closed a deal because of the podcast, but here's what I can tell you. The podcast is the number one marketing activity that you've initiated since you took over marketing. <laughs> and I was like, well, well that, I mean, on, on one hand, I'm like, I'm like, well, so I like part of what you said, but I don't like the fact that you actually say you can't, you, you haven't closed the deal, you know, like, so, but tell me why, I mean, it's great to hear. I'm happy. And he said, Mark, he said, here's the difference. He said, whereas before we'd get on a call and, and, and the company was pretty well known in the space. So it wasn't that they struggled to get meetings, but there was always that initial kind of dance back and forth, like, tell us what you do and prove, prove that you know, we should listen to you, you know, meaning the, the customer, the buyer is kind of, he said, and now we get on a call and almost invariably the first thing they say is, is, Oh, we love your podcast. Oh, I listen to your podcast. Oh, by the way, I really love this episode. And he said, Mark, that's just like, like you just cut through everything that previously, you know, it would have taken maybe more meetings or, or whatever. And <sighs> that's so tough to quantify because you tell that story and, and, and we're so used to both as marketers and then executives to want to take everything back to a metric. And there is no metric for that. And yet to this day, and the reason why they're still, you know, running the podcast and I'm fortunate enough to still be able to co-host it is because it's their number one marketing activity. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and it just works. It just really, really, really works. And so, yeah. The, uh, you know, and that's fun, you know, when these start to really connect to real business, because obviously that's, that's what we're here for. And again, you know, as I stated early on, I'm a salesperson. So, uh, you know, at heart, you know, I'm a salesperson. So, you know, I'm always trying to take it back to, but what is the business result? You know, how much revenue have we driven and these activities drive revenue? They really do. Yes, I agree. And I think all marketers can relate to wanting to be more valuable and getting that fantastic anecdotal feedback and evidence yeah. from the sales team that what they're investing their time and energy in is working. So yeah. that is a great story. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark, we are at the end of our time. Thank you so much. We've definitely covered a lot of ground. I think some things we can state as core themes are you can't create community without effort. And the effort needs to be intentional and really focused on the softer qualities of what your audience is looking for. What's important mm -hmm. to them? What's interesting? How can you help solve their problems without selling? So I am really excited for everyone to hear this episode. How can people reach you or hear your podcast if they are interested in learning more? Yeah, well, my podcast is is pretty geeky. So, <laughs> but 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 if you're if you're in the video space or interested in the video space, um, it's thevideoinsiders.com. So, okay. just the video insiders that goes to the website. We're on all of the podcast platforms, so you could certainly uh, certainly check that out. And then my personal website is growthstage.marketing. So just growth stage dot marketing and um, you can learn more about, you know, what I do. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you again for being a guest and uh, for everyone else. If you're interested in hearing more episodes from Leader Generation, visit tenlo.com. That's T-E-N-L-O.com. And you can subscribe or download our podcast from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, really anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And Mark, you gave us one great idea on here about starting a LinkedIn group. Our episode, a couple, or maybe this week's episode, I can't remember, the one right before this suggested that we give away 10 low mugs to anyone who has an awesome topic idea. So I hey. also- All right, I'll that. take one. Yes, <laughs> if you have a great idea for a show, please come to our website, enter it in the chat, we'll use it, <laughs> or join our new LinkedIn group that is That's going right. to be launching now <laughs> in a few weeks. Um, but thank you, Mark, so much for being on the show. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Tessa. It was great to be here. <laughs>